Hey everyone, welcome back to the Strange Gaming Sphere of weekly video game editorials, news, and gameplay. This is a video I've wanted to make for a very long time, something I've wanted to discuss for over 23 something years now, since I played Final Fantasy Tactics back in 1998, but it was only recently with Final Fantasy 16's announcement trailer that I decided it was finally time to get it out there, so this video will be touching on what made me even create this channel to begin with. So first off, forgive the delay, this video's been in the works for a while now, but it's also one that I felt needed a slightly larger audience than the 10 subscribers I had when it was first conceptualized. And as I've crossed the 1K subscriber threshold recently, I felt the timing was appropriate. In this video, we're going to discuss my favorite Final Fantasy and game of all time, which is Final Fantasy Tactics, and why I firmly believe, even to this day, that it is Square's greatest and most underrated masterpiece in video game narrative storytelling. Unfortunately, it was a game that was overshadowed by Final Fantasy VII as they both released roughly around the same time. The game was released in 1997 in Japan and early 1998 here in the United States. Many Final Fantasy fans today, and even non-Final Fantasy fans, have most likely played Final Fantasy VII in some form, be it in the remake or the original, but almost no non-Final Fantasy fans, and even a fair number of newer generation and veteran FF fans, have ever even played Final Fantasy Tactics. But the indie offbeat Final Fantasy games, what I call the Matsuno-style Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy Tactics, Final Fantasy XII, Final Fantasy XIV to an extent, Final Fantasy XVI, or even related games a la Vagrant Story, would never have existed had it not been for the boldness and the direction that Square took with Final Fantasy Tactics. This to me was the genesis of where Final Fantasy truly, truly as a series, beyond a doubt distinguished itself and exhibited its true potential. And on a personal level, it was the game that cemented Final Fantasy's place in my life. Final Fantasy VI, IV, and V, they were my foray into the franchise, but the experience I had playing Final Fantasy Tactics became the measuring stick for all other Final Fantasy games that I came to love, including Seven, and ultimately, the experience that I measured all other games by. So, just a little bit of history, Final Fantasy Tactics was the brainchild of the legendary Yasumi Matsuno, who originally developed the idea of a tactical RPG based off of two previous games he developed while working for Quest Games back in the 1990s, Ogre Battle and the later refined Tactics Ogre. Matsuno was a fan of story-based war simulation games, and after leaving Quest Games for personal reasons, he joined up with Squaresoft, who saw the popularity that Tactics Ogre enjoyed in Japan. And what they did was, they very smartly gave Matsuno full control of Final Fantasy Tactics development, where he implemented the many ideas that he'd learned at Quest developing Tactics Ogre. Unlike other Final Fantasy games at the time, Final Fantasy Tactics battles took place on an isometric battlefield, and the flow of combat uses something called a charge time battle system, which was co-developed by him and Hiroyuki Ito, who had developed the turn-based and the ATB battle systems of other Final Fantasy games. CTB combat revolves around an active turn list, which is basically a queue of turns determined by a character's speed stats. Also, unlike previous Final Fantasy games, which used a very rough speed calculation to determine the next character's turn, CTB's combat was far more precise, almost like playing chess. So for example, a character with speed 10 will reach 100% of their CTB bar in 10 clock ticks, whereas a character with speed 5 will reach 100% of their CTB bar in 20 clock ticks. Same with spells and abilities. Other stats like range, evasion, physical attack, and magic attack were also similarly calculated in this very precise way and play a far more critical role in the game's strategic combat. It's a very transparent battle system where active turn, attack damage, pretty much everything is far more deterministic. Add on to that the deep character customization system that the game offers in the form of job classes that lets you assign primary abilities, secondary abilities, reactions, support, movement, and you've got one of the most engaging tactical RPGs ever created because it gave you the freedom to create your party from scratch to suit your specific playstyle. And every decision you make pre-battle has an outcome that will carry over into battle and beyond. So in that sense, the game does play very much like an interactive chess game, just set within the Final Fantasy universe. As a result, the game was a commercial hit in both Japan and the US. Its story, its characters, the world, Everything was just far more accessible despite retaining the same tactical difficulty that Tactics Ogre was known for. And since its release, Final Fantasy Tactics saw two sequels, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, released on the Game Boy Advance, 
and Final Fantasy Tactics Advance 2 Grimoire of the Rift, released on the Nintendo DS. Though the games were more of a spin-off and less direct sequels, ones that, in my opinion, were nowhere nearly as good as Tactics, their battle mechanics and even the art style felt like a step backwards in the direction of Tactics Ogre, and their story felt like a paltry kid's fairy tale in comparison to Tactics' more mature themes of war, politics, and chivalry. A little over a decade later, Square was to revisit the original Final Fantasy Tactics in the form of Final Fantasy Tactics The War of the Lions, which was a port of the original Final Fantasy Tactics onto the PlayStation Portable, featuring the exact same game but with additional job classes, additional quest battles and stories, beautifully cel-shaded animated cutscenes by the way, but the most significant overhaul was to the game's beige prose dialogue. The original tactics suffered from localization issues typical of JRPGs of that era, so the game text and dialogue were rewritten into a more prosaic Game of Thrones Shakespearean dialogue thanks to the excellent work of Tom Slattery. Personally, I find the dialogue upgrade to lend far better and clearer to the game's storytelling experience, though admittedly, it's one that can also feel like it reads far better than it speaks. Written and directed by Yasumi Matsuno, the main storyline of Final Fantasy Tactics has a lot of parallels with the medieval world of Game of Thrones, which takes its inspiration from medieval Scottish history. Final Fantasy Tactics takes place in the Kingdom of Ivalice, which had become embroiled in a bitter war of succession on who will become the next king. So on one side is Duke Larg, who is symbolized by the White Lion, and on the other side is Duke Oltana, who is symbolized by the Black Lion, and this war of succession between them became known as the War of the Lions. What starts off as plots within plots of warring kingdoms, feudal class power struggles, political backstabbing, deception and betrayal, eventually escalates into an epically bloody military conflict being manipulated from the shadows by men seeking control of the throne, who are in turn being secretly manipulated by men of the church, who are also in turn being secretly manipulated by the legendary demons of this world known as the Lukavi. We experience the events leading up to the war and the war itself through the eyes of Ramza Beovo, who is the youngest member of House Beovo, and his childhood friend Delita. Those of House Beovo are considered to be high even among the highborn, and in this deeply feudal and classist society where those in power rule the powerless, we get an intimate glimpse of how Ramza and Delita's different stations in life and the tragedies that they each experience in war ultimately shaped their divergent philosophies and paths. What makes Final Fantasy Tactics sociologically constructed stories so fascinating is that it shows how class differences can actually cut both ways for not just Ramza and Delita but for all of its characters, and how despite their virtuous or despicable acts, their behaviors are neither fully good nor fully evil at any one point. As the youngest member of House Beovo, Ramza starts off in the game feeling utterly inadequate compared to his older brothers as he was an illegitimate child of his father's affair with a lowborn courtesan. While Ramza is a mere squire aspiring to become a knight, his brothers Dysadarg and Zalbog are decorated military commanders and right-hand counsels to the duke. But unlike his brothers who willfully use their power for political gain, Ramza instead inherited his father's sense of knightly justice and chivalry and honor. His father, who was a war hero and a legendary knight gallant, could have easily been forgiven for treating Ramza as a lesser child, but instead chose not to let prejudice rule his life. And this is the same spirit that is at the core of Ramza's character. And that same courtesy was also extended to Delita, who was a lowborn commoner adopted by House Beovo after his parents died from the plague. He too was raised believing the same virtues of knightly justice, honor, and chivalry. But due to his station in life, he feels just as inadequate within House Beovo as Ramza. And because of this, the two became like brothers, who always saw each other as equals. Even though the expectation was that Delita would one day grow up to become Ramza a servant. So unlike Ramza, who was technically still a noble by birth, Delita's feelings of inadequacy as a lowborn go far, far deeper. And this rift between the two didn't truly start to emerge until they rescued a highborn squire named Argith, whose utter contempt for those of low birth drives a wedge between Ramza and Delita. And that growing rift absolutely tore wide open when Delita's sister Titra is kidnapped by enemies of House Beovo and is murdered by Argith when she's used as a human shield. Delita's world is utterly shattered by what he just seen, and Ramza's world is equally shattered when he realizes that it was his brothers who ordered the killing. It was unthinkable to him that House Beovo, a house that had faithfully served the crown's justice for centuries, would be so despicably cavalier in sacrificing an innocent girl for victory, and for no other reason than the fact that she was low-born and therefore expendable. You see, Ramza was always aware of the divide that existed between nobles and commoners, but having grown up around Delita and Titra and inheriting his father's sense of justice, 
He also struggled to understand why people like Argeth would treat commoners with such contempt just because of who their parents were. And this harrowing realization that somehow his privilege came at a moral cost left Ramza completely broken. He would felt as if he'd taken his entire life for granted. And when the pillars of that life came crashing down all around him, he couldn't bear to stand around and just watch it crumble. He merely just ran away from it all. And on that same day, Titra's murder filled Delita with a hatred against all nobles, and he vowed to overthrow the aristocracy at any cost. And Ramza, by proxy, would be met with the same contempt. One year later, Ramza becomes a mercenary and fights under his mother's maiden name to further distance himself from House Beyovel, which was a name that no longer bore the same virtues of justice, honor, and pride that it once stood for him. Meanwhile, Delita has grown into a formidable holy knight, fighting under the auspice of the church and falsely under an opposing banner. And as the story progresses, both Ramza and Delita get swept up by the events leading up to the war. But while Ramza becomes determined to stop the war at any cost and unwittingly getting caught up in his brother's plots yet again, Delita seems intent on manipulating the war for his own gain. I won't spoil the rest of the story for those of you who haven't yet played it, but the short of it is that this game had all the makings of a brilliant Game of Thrones-like fantasy world and story. There's plots of heresy and treason, sons murdering their fathers, generals betraying their kings, members of the church manipulating both sides of the war against each other in an effort to bring the crown under their control only to realize that they are in turn being manipulated themselves from the shadows by the devil. What's so brilliantly ironic about Final Fantasy Tactics story and what makes its design so just off the charts amazing is that Ramza, by doing everything that he could to stop the war and his brothers, became the noble knight that his father foresaw for him on his deathbed. And yet he is branded an outlaw for it and is basically declared a heretic by the church and forgotten by history. Whereas Delita, and even a Robin Hood peasant freedom fighter like Wegraf, who bartered their souls away for power, manipulated the war for their own ends, murdered countless thousands of innocent people in the process, basically becoming no better than the nobles that they grew to despise, yet Delita becomes a king for it and is remembered throughout history as a hero. The ending of Final Fantasy Tactics was also very different from what past Final Fantasy games were known for, but it was also very fitting. Ramza was never interested in fame or glory. He was only interested in weeding out what he perceived to be injustice through virtuous means, which is a stark contrast to his brothers and the rest of Ivalice and Delita. They all sought to weed out injustice as they perceived it, but through lies and deception. So their ends were the same, but the means became the crucial difference between them. Ramza ultimately saved the kingdom of Ivalice from chaos. And yet, instead of thanks, he was branded a heretic, disowned by his brothers, and didn't even receive a proper burial. As Final Fantasy heroes goes, or even anti-heroes, it's easy to do the right thing when fanfare, adulation, and getting the girl are associated with it, but it's far more difficult to do the right thing when there are no rewards and you're forced to sacrifice everything except for your principles like Ramza did. A lot of the appeal of Final Fantasy games to fans back then and even now usually boiled down to the visual character design. The characters did have a story to them, yes, but a lot of their story was in their visual design as well. So interesting hair, armor, clothing, weapons, a distinctive look, hence the cosplay. But Final Fantasy Tactics appeal pivoted far less on the visual character design and far more on the character's story, their actual place in the world that they lived in, and how that world shaped their point of view. By every measure, Ramza is a far more compelling Final Fantasy character than Cloud. But Cloud is the more iconic Final Fantasy character because he's got the cool hair and the iconic sword and the Omni Slash, same with Squall, and so forth. They have more compelling visual designs. Ramza wasn't the most powerful or the most handsome of the Final Fantasy protagonists. He didn't have a unique facial scar or tattoos or cool ultimate weapon or limit break finisher or even fancy cool hair. He didn't have a romance plot where he was chasing the girls for their affection or was being chased by them, nor did he have some mysterious anti-hero backstory that was shoehorned in to justify some complicated irrational behavior. He was just an idealistic young man who believed so strongly in justice and what it meant to be a true knight that he wouldn't compromise those principles at any cost, regardless of the outcome. That's what made Ramza resonate so strongly with me as a youth far more than any other Final Fantasy character or character in any other game or book or movie, and why I believe that Final Fantasy Tactics is still, bar none, Square's greatest underrated masterpiece in storytelling and characters. 
When the Final Fantasy 16 trailer was released, the excitement in the Final Fantasy community was palpable over the possibility that we were going to finally get a more mature Game of Thrones like Final Fantasy going back to its high fantasy medieval roots. But Final Fantasy Tactics had already done this 23 years ago, back in 1997-1998, which was roughly four to five years after the first Game of Thrones books were released in 1993, but long before the Game of Thrones TV show had popularized it. Back in 1998, playing a mature Game of Thrones like Final Fantasy for the very first time was an indescribable experience. I was so enthralled and became so deeply woven into its story and its characters that even to this day, no game, not even Final Fantasy VII, God of War, Resident Evil 2, Parasite Eve, Hollow Knight, Ori, Nier Automata, nothing has come close to matching it. Final Fantasy games back then were like in a class of their own as far as narrative storytelling in a video game, but Final Fantasy Tactics was in a class of its own even above that. Its sheer breadth of storytelling made every game that I've played since then feel meek by comparison. Keep in mind that this was a game written back in the 1990s when the equivalent of stories in most video games was the president has been kidnapped by ninjas or save the princess from Bowser. And it still somehow manages to surpass the narrative storytelling in video games made today because Final Fantasy Tactics went above and beyond what was already above and beyond. It was the first and only game that I can recall of that era that included the entire lore of the world in game for this very purpose in the form of archives, brave story, a full breakdown of all the characters, events, maps, artifacts, treasures, which made playing Final Fantasy Tactics a lot like playing an interactive history book that actually felt like it made history come alive. Over the years, I have easily poured thousands of hours into this game via patches and mods, and I fondly remember spending hours just reading through all of the archives, no differently than spending time reading about the events and the people involved in the California Gold Rush, which is another amazing moment in history I've studied quite deeply. When Final Fantasy VII Remake was announced, I was excited as all hell, just like everyone else for it, beyond a doubt. But what I truly wished for was a remake of Final Fantasy Tactics. Because it's ironic to me that as great as Tactics was, it was also a game that I felt was largely forgotten by Square. To me, the real tragic irony of Final Fantasy Tactics is that despite being a successful game that redefined the genre of tactical RPGs just as much as Tactics Ogre did, gamers 23 years later still scavenge the genre for anything that can even remotely be half as good. Even to this day, Tactics is still a game that I feel has no comparable sequel. But given Yasumi Matsuno's seminal influence on Naoki Yoshida, who is the producer and director of Final Fantasy XIV and the producer of Final Fantasy XVI, and his influence on Yoshida's entire creative business unit 3, including Hiroshi Takai, who will be directing Final Fantasy XVI, and Kazutoyo Maehiro, who is Matsuno's spiritual successor and the rumored scenario writer for XVI, all signs are pointing to Final Fantasy XVI being Tactic's spiritual successor and one that would do its best to live up to that legacy. As amazing as the original Final Fantasy VII was when it first came out, Final Fantasy Tactics to me was the game that shaped the way I saw the world going forward. It was the game that I believe, looking back on it now, truly led me down the path of being a script writer and a storyteller to this day. The game dove very deeply and maturely into themes of nobility, chivalry, honor, and pride. And through Ramza, it taught me one of the most valuable life lessons that I still hold true to this day, which is that even if honorable endeavors don't often yield the ends that we desire, we must always act and behave honorably in spite of that, or we risk becoming just as dishonorable and despicable as those whose actions and behaviors we condemn. Ramza's words upon facing the hardest choices that he had to make in his life were as meaningful to me 23 years ago as they are now. And that is that morally, we are the sum of our deeds, not our names. As always, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe if you find these videos helpful or entertaining. Dislike if not. I could continue talking about this game for hours on end, but for the sake of your sanity and mine, I will leave you all with that for now. I've transcribed the entire game script into a single easy to read document, which I'll leave a link in the description below for anyone interested in experiencing the story without needing to actually play the game. But I do encourage you to play the game regardless, since it is a true gem of a masterpiece. So I will probably also end up live streaming it down the line at some point as well. But until then, stay tuned and take care.